Thank you. Thank you. Everyone hear me okay? I will talk with my teacher voice. There's also some magical things happening with the laptop and the screen going away. So normally I'm a very active presenter and I would walk out this way. However, I'm frightened to do that. So I will wait until the end um, so that we can make sure we get through all of the slides first and, and then when we do q and I'll step out. So yes, thank you for that amazing introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, Robert didn't mention he is also a volunteer of Denver Audubon. So we are very grateful to have volunteers from all over the metropolitan area and I'll give a nod to them in a little bit. So I first wanted to introduce Denver Audubon, who we are, and kind of share a little bit about our story, and then we'll jump into some of the science, which is a little depressing, and then we'll jump into the solutions and what everyone can do tonight to help. So our mission at Denver Audubon is inspiring actions that protect birds, other wildlife, and their habitats through education, conservation, and research. It's one thing to know what birds you're looking at, what birds you're seeing. It's quite another thing to take action and to take movement in your own life to help protect those birds. And so that's what we're gonna kind of chat about tonight. We are what's called an independent chapter of National Audubon. So I often mention this when I do community outreach presentations because it's a point of confusion. It was for me when I got hired. So I've gotten everything worked out. I know everything now that I can share with you. So we're called an independent chapter. We are a 501c3 nonprofit separate from National Audubon. All of our board members are local community members that live here in the Denver metro area. Um, at least two or three of them are residents in Douglas County currently, actually. Um, and then Audubon Rockies is the national Audubon office that represents Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, but they are a separate nonprofit from us. So even though we collaborate on a lot of things, um, I'm actually a local employee of a local nonprofit that is completely separate from national. So I was mentioning before our amazing uh, volunteers. We have about 120 of them. Robert and Heather are both here tonight. Um, and so they live here in Parker. They help me with a lot of our programs in Parker. But we have volunteers that span all the way from Lafayette down to Colorado Springs. They actually stretch across the entire Front Range. Um, and we just wouldn't be able to do all the amazing work that we do without them. So I do like to give them a nod anytime I'm doing community outreach program. Um, we also have some teen volunteers. These were a couple of the founders of our Young Birders Club. And they came to me about three years ago and said, Kate, we are so tired of not finding other young people to go look at birds with us. Can you find a way to bring us all together? And so I said, yeah, let's sit down. Let's tell me what you'd like to do. And so they were the reason why we now have a Young Birders Club. So really incredible, incredible people. Um, and a couple of them have gone on to actually go to School of Mines here in Colorado and the Cornell Lab of uh, Ornithology in New York. So just really amazing young people. We're also funded by the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District. If you're involved with Parker Arts, uh, you will know that Parker Arts is also, and the Pace Center also funded by SCFD. So we're what's called a tier three nonprofit organization. So we get um, funding from Douglas County, Jefferson County, and from Arapahoe County. Interestingly enough, we don't qualify for funding in Denver, even though we're Denver Audubon. But our nature center and our offices are located in Jeffco. And so a chunk of, uh, of our SCFD money and general operating comes from Jefferson County. So this statistic is actually a little old. This was 100 billion, but this was prior to 2019. Um, and they estimated that more than 45 million people in the US watch birds. And they do spend a lot of money on traveling to see birds and equipment and things like that. So there is a beneficial economic value as well. And then over 60% of our drinking water comes from rivers and streams. And so protecting waterways and protecting those bird habitats also equates to clean and healthy water for us as humans. So just a lot of really wonderful reasons to, um, to enjoy birds and, and to consider why they matter. So this is the bad news. Then we're gonna get into the good news. So there were some studies, um, a, a couple different studies actually that came out. So this is the big one. This actually came out also in 2019. In the fall of 2019, around November, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Birds Canada, and actually Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, which is a local organization we partner with here in Colorado, they put out um, this study. So what they did was they took 
data from all of these different bird counts that people had been doing since 1970 through 2017, and they put all of the bird counts into this giant calculation. And what they found is that in North America, because I actually had a question one time during an outreach presentation if this was globally. This is North America, so just our continent. Um, we've lost 2.9 billion birds since 1970. So that equates to about one in four being, being gone. And so we do have a lot of people that will call us and anecdotally say, I feel like I don't notice as many birds at my bird feeders. I remember when I was a kid just like feeling like they were everywhere, that I'd walk and I'd hear them and I'd see them. And now I go out and I recreate and I don't hear as many and I don't see as many. And what was kind of sobering, I think, about this study is that it, it actually quantified that for us. It was no longer sort of this anecdotal thing. It's, oh no, we, we actually do have the numbers and the data to support this. Um, and they're talking about breeding adult birds specifically, so they didn't count fledglings. Um, and it includes birds in every ecosystem. So urban habitats, prairie habitats, forests, mountains, um, a lot. So there is the uh, actual study name below, Decline of North American Avifauna, that was released in 2019. So to make this a little bit more local, one of the things we like to share about is um, there is a breeding bird atlas of which a lot of our master birder volunteers and people from Colorado field ornithologists and Denver field ornithologists they go out and volunteer counting nesting birds and birds that are breeding in Colorado. Um, and we've had two volumes. So this was actually the second one. There was a first one um, that came out prior to 2016. And as you can imagine, you know, by the time you count all these birds, put it all together in a book, the data changes. Um, so there are some really great tools for capturing birds in real time, which I'll share later. Um, but something as common, and this was really surprising to me, something as common as a black-capped chickadee from 1995 to 2012 in Colorado declined about 14%. And I feel like I see black-capped chickadees everywhere. Um, but they're found in deciduous and mixed deciduous coniferous forests, urban and suburban areas. Um, and so something that could potentially be contributing to this is habitat loss, um, being able to kind of uh, see some of those forests being removed at the edge of plains and development happening. And so, you know, it, it's hard to say exactly what's causing the decline, but they can just say, okay, well, we counted this many sets of nesting black-capped chickadees, and they found an overall decline in the species. American robins, interestingly enough, didn't do as bad. So they're just declined about 3%. American robins are really amazing generalists. You can have one all the way up in the subalpine forest and all the way down in your backyard. Um, so they really span, as you can see on the map, a ton of different areas in Colorado. Um, but there are some different areas in Colorado where they've seen some localized declines. So things like the Colorado Plateau in southeast Colorado, um, where it's been correlated to being things like decreased berry crops or other types of food sources. So one of the reasons why you don't see American robins coming to your backyard bird feeder is because they don't eat bird seed. They eat insects and they eat fruit. Um, and a lot of that comes from our native plants. So we'll kind of share about that in a little bit as well. Oh, sorry, yes, so our yellow warbler. So yellow warblers, interestingly enough, increased 8%. So that's good news. And we had to kind of ask ourselves, okay, well, what is causing this increase? Like, what are we doing right? What are some of the things that we could be doing? And what I can tell you about yellow warblers is that they nest near rivers and creeks and areas where there's a lot of storm water preservation being done. And so places like Cherry Creek or places like Chatfield State Park at our nature center have a lot of yellow warblers that nest there specifically. Um, and with, since these areas are protected, usually for either recreation or for storm water, that's a great opportunity for yellow warblers to come in and nest and be successful. But there's other parts of the United States where the data actually is suggesting that nationwide they're declining, but here in Colorado, they're actually increasing. So great, that's wonderful. So there is some um, good opportunity. So we're gonna go through these seven simple actions to help birds. This is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology based on a lot of different things. And there's a lot of things that weren't mentioned, of course. 
But as adults, we really can't process more than seven things. There's seven days in a week. So just pick one every day, um, and you can start there. Um, so we don't want to overwhelm you, but this was what the Cornell Lab of Ornithology came up with. So we're going to go through each of these just very briefly. Um, making windows safe, keeping cats indoors, less lawn plant natives, avoid pesticides, drink shade-grown coffee, use less plastic, and watch birds and share what you see. So we're going to start with windows, window strikes. So there's a couple of different considerations with window strikes. Um, so we have some different strategies that you can use. A lot of people's personal windows at their homes are kind of a hazard for birds, but the other piece of the puzzle are all these amazing skyscrapers that we're putting up that have zero reflective windows for, um, or zero reflective protection on their windows for birds. Um, and so this has been an interesting dichotomy to watch. So it's very easy, you all are the low hanging fruit here. If you have windows at your house where birds are running into them, there's a lot of great things you can do. Trying to talk to a business or a company owner that has a skyscraper in downtown Denver has not proven as easy. But if you know someone, please let me know. We'd love to sit down and have a cup of bird-friendly coffee with them. Um, so window decals are one option. What's interesting is window decals were really kind of cutting edge even when I started at Audubon eight years ago. And since then, we actually have a couple different recommendations. One of the challenges with window decals is because you can't always evenly space them, it leaves a lot of open space in a certain window setting. So this may not be as effective, but for small windows, it could work. Now, skyscrapers, on the other hand, this is an example of an initiative that we're involved with called Lights Out Denver. And this is a, a picture of a common poor will that actually survived a window strike with one of the skyscrapers in downtown Denver. So a volunteer found him, he was still alive, and he was able to get to a wildlife hospital and um, get cured, help, nursed back to health, um, and then was able to be released and go back out into the wild, so that's great. I apologize for the tiny text here, but um, so our partners at Denver Parks and Recreation, they're the ones that actually spearheaded this initiative, and they have volunteers currently right now, starting like this week, that go out at 5 a.m. in downtown Denver and look for birds that have hit windows overnight. Um, and so one of the things that we are trying to do is talk with business owners in downtown Denver about ways that they could turn off lights or have lights on timers so that you don't have this big, huge, glaring kind of beacon and a lot of birds get very confused and a lot of our songbirds, go figure, migrate at night. They use stellar maps. So our little yellow warbler that we saw earlier, they actually wait until it's really dark they look at the sky and then they go, oh cool, that's that constellation, which means I need to head that way. And when we have a lot of urban light pollution, uh, they, they can't actually see their stellar maps either. So they get very confused, um, they get tired, they can run into a building that way, or maybe they don't realize that there's a window and they see something they wanna perch on and they'll go right to it. So some of the options for you, uh, keeping cats indoors is better for cats and birds overall in Colorado. Of course, we do have issues with great horned owl. We do have issues with coyote. So if your cat roams around outside, there are those threats to the cat as well. Um, I do have a lot of people who share with me I, there is just no way that I could have my cat be indoors. There's no way. And you know your cat best. Some cats are specifically barn cats because you want them to help keep mice and things away from your barn. But I just ask you to consider if you're not watching them all the time, are there other things maybe that they're getting like small songbirds that are unintended prey? So this is a really fun website to show you what's possible. And maybe it's not possible with this current cat you have, but maybe you're gonna be like my mom and you're gonna decide to foster a kitten and then you're gonna decide to just keep it and then you're gonna start trying to train it to walk on a harness. Um, but this is called Adventure Cats. And these are people who paddleboard with their cats, hike 14ers with their cats. I've seen it personally. They go camping with their cats. They canoe with their cats. They kayak with their cats. I have a unique perspective on this as well because my background before Audubon was actually exotic wildlife. 
So I can share with you personally that I have seen a 400 pound tiger trained to lay down willingly for a blood draw and not move. It is possible, but oftentimes we as trainers and pet owners have to think about what's possible and try it and just, and just see if it will work for our, for our pet. Um, so what I love, <laughs> I just love this quote from them. Not all cats are content to simply watch the world through the window. Meet the fearless felines who accompany their humans on outdoor excursions. So it's just great to see what other people have been able to accomplish with their cats exploring in the great outdoors and keeping birds safe at the same time. So that's wonderful. Les Lawn and Plant Natives. Oh, I apologize. This is where my native plant masterness comes out. So our backyards are part of a larger landscape or a side yard or a front yard or the little strip in front of your driveway. So what I really love to highlight when it comes to native plants is that every patch of soil is an opportunity. Any patch of soil in Colorado, even how poor the soil may be, um, is an opportunity. So there's a lot of great plants that you can plant that are native to the state of Colorado or native to the Western US that you can put in that will support birds, use less water, they deal with all kinds of crazy Colorado weather whiplash. Um, and so being able to do some of those things um, and rip out some of your lawn and plant some of these natives, and I'm gonna get into natives a little bit more later, um, is a really great option. Okay, so avoid pesticides. This kind of goes hand in hand with our native plants. Of course, um, with a lot of our natives, which I've got a couple more pictured here, when you put in native plants, you don't necessarily have to worry about using pesticides or herbicides because a lot of our native plants are already naturally prone to certain types of diseases that some of our other landscaping plants can't avoid. So something like blue grama, which is our state grass of Colorado, if you put something in like this, you plant it, you leave it, and you just say, bye, have fun. Enjoy, enjoy the poor Colorado soil and I'm not gonna water you at all. Have a great, have a great time. Um, and so that's what we did with our demonstration gardens at Chatfield. All of our demonstration gardens around our nature center are rainwater only irrigation. So there's no actual formal irrigation at all. Um, and then something like a golden current. So if you put in a shrub that has berries, for local birds. This is gonna help increase your diversity in your backyard um, a ton. And I've done this in my own backyard. I'm a resident here in Parker. And when I started becoming a native plant master, I went to my poor husband and I said, we're gonna rip everything out. We're gonna start over from scratch. And he was really excited about that. <laughs> Um, but we did, we, we took out everything that came with our house and we redid all of the established landscaping beds that were there, which wasn't a ton. Our, our landscape isn't huge, um, but putting in things like golden current, or this is one of my favorites, which I have in my backyard currently, are bee balm. Um, also, obviously hummingbirds love it. So even though it's, it's called bee balm, hummingbirds enjoy it as well. And on the table as you leave tonight, I do have a handout front and back on our native plants for birds. So if that's something you're interested in, um, we can definitely give you some other recommendations. And then one of the other big reasons why native plants are so critical to bird populations and actually increasing and bringing bird populations back has to do with what we see happening um, with a lot of these photos here. So we've got a hummingbird going after a midge, which is a small flying insect. We've got a bluebird, a mountain bluebird with a caterpillar in its mouth. This is a pygmy nuthatch with a miller moth in its mouth. And then a swallow, a cliff swallow, I threw that in there. It doesn't have any insect pictured in its mouth, but they eat a lot of mosquitoes. So a lot of our migratory birds that are terrestrial bird species. So we're talking about songbirds, woodpeckers, hummingbirds, um, corvids, which are like our crows, our ravens, our jays. Almost all of them feed insects to their young. So we're talking about 96% of them. And this was a study that came out in 1999. So it's not new, 
But Doug Tallamy, who wrote a book, Bringing Nature Home, about 10 years ago, highlighted this study in his book. And he is an entomologist, and he really started trying to explain to people, our native plants are the building blocks of every other level of ecosystem above it. And we all have a choice as to what plants we put in our landscape. And so if we're choosing plants that are native to Africa or native to Europe, they might look beautiful, but ecologically, they're not serving the same function that our native plants are. And to get a little more science on you, we're gonna specifically talk about caterpillars. So caterpillars are the favorite food for many, many parent birds. And what I love about this study that Dr. Ashley Kennedy did, who studied under Doug, Doug Tallamy, she actually had people submit photos to her with a bird and an insect in its mouth, and then being an entomologist, she was able to identify what a lot of those insects were. And what blew my mind, personally, you all, is that 77% of the photos she got of chickadees had a caterpillar in its mouth. And these are birds that come to our backyard bird feeders all the time. I had no idea how much chickadees would feed off of caterpillars. So then there was an additional study where they actually did this on Carolina chickadees in the East Coast, and they watched two parent birds feed four babies, and for a total of about 12 to 14 days, they fed anywhere from 6,000 to 8,000 caterpillars because they're flying all the time, trying to find caterpillars. Oh, okay, we found one, we have to feed you. Shoot, now we gotta go back out. Oh, then there comes the other one. Now we gotta feed you too. So in a single day, they could go through 150 caterpillars times 12 to 14 days times four mouths to feed. Incredible. The reason why this all matters then coming back to the native plants is when you look at moths or butterflies, most of them also only specialize in plants that are native to Colorado, to our region right here, 90% of them. There's a handful of them, about 10%, that are specialists, or generalists, I'm sorry. So they might have you know, 100 host plants. They might have 100 plants they can lay their eggs on, and the caterpillars can feed off of those plants. But 90% of them actually have to have host plants that look like all these different things. We have 250 species of butterfly in Colorado, and they all host on different things. Some of them host on grasses, some of them host on perennials, some of them host on trees, some of them host on shrubs. Monarchs are what people are most familiar with. Monarchs and milkweed, beautiful relationship. 90% of our butterflies are in the same boat. And when you have so many caterpillars that are needed to feed baby birds, you got to have a lot more native plants. And what we've done is we've taken a lot of our native plants out of the landscape. So this is a great picture. I'd just like to throw this in. This was one that we uh, planted in our demonstration gardens at Chatfield. This is great blanket flower. So this is a native species. It's in the aster family. It's related to sunflowers. And I love this picture because we have one of our native white butterflies, a checkered white. Um, we also have a um, fritillary on the left. And behind is a bee. I snapped this photo, this photo um, and this was within 10 minutes of putting this plant in the ground. Because we had a huge, massive planting day. And we, put, we were putting a bunch of new things in, and I was actually stalking the white butterfly, and then the orange one came in, and then when I snapped the picture, I just happened to have a, a bee that flew through the back. So it was just, it was amazing. Plant it and they will come. Okay, I'm off my native plant soapbox for now. Drink shade grown coffee. So I do have an example of the Allegro coffee that is out on the table. Um, so this is a certification that the Smithsonian created, just like organic, fair trade. It is a certification that coffee uh, roasters and coffee producers have to you know, pay for it and go through certain steps. But Allegro is one of the brands. Um, it was actually roasted here in Thornton for many years, and they closed their roasting operation here in Denver, which is a bummer. Um, but Allegro coffee is found at Whole Foods. But you can also order online things like birds and beans coffee. You can also um, go to some of the specialty bird stores or natural grocers, places like that, and look for this certification. And I figured I drink coffee every morning. I might as well have bird-friendly certified coffee. So much to my dad's chagrin, who was a Folgers man, um, I, now, I now drink bird-friendly coffee. 
And then using less plastic, so I think there's a lot of kind of obvious reasons around plastic entanglement that a lot of wildlife you know, experience, and we've seen that. Um, but I wanted to kind of share with you a little program that we do with some of our fifth graders, which is dissecting albatross bolus. So albatross are huge seabirds. They don't live anywhere near Colorado. Uh, but we have a colleague that works for U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and they package up these little regurgitated, disgusting smelling pellets and mail them to us here in Denver, Colorado. And then we take them to the middle schools and to the fifth grade, and we go, why don't we dissect this and see what's in it? So albatross being purely seabirds, they're supposed to be feeding off of things like squid and fish. What was shocking to me, even when I first got hired, and also in a previous life, I worked at the downtown aquarium for 10 years, so ocean plastic is something that is near and dear to my heart as well. But we would dissect these bolus, and the majority of what we would find were little tiny bits of plastic, like this, from bottle caps, from styrofoam cups, um, and these are the things that the albatross are finding in the ocean and picking up to feed their babies, when what they should be feeding them is squid and fish. But it's because plastic is so pervasive, and these poor parents are like, well, I don't, I mean, I guess I'll pick that up and feed it to you um, because it's here, and I can't find the food I'm actually searching for. So in desperation, they probably grab some pieces of plastic and go, well, I'll feed that to you and see, uh, and see how it does. So unfortunately, sometimes these birds end up passing away um, and their stomachs are just full of plastic. Um, plastic and styrofoam cups and bottle caps and just all kinds of nasty stuff when it should be squid beaks. The other thing that's slightly alarming is we have now found um, microplastics here in the snowpack in Colorado. So there was a study that they did where they were surveying from 2013 to 2016, um, and the US Geological Survey was actually looking at um, some of the different snowpack in the Colorado River Basin, and they found pieces of plastic that are undetectable to the human eye. So you have to actually look under a microscope to find those. So it is traveling. It's traveling the planet um, in different ways. And then last but not least, watch birds and share what you see. So we hope that you'll maybe come out and do some of these things with us. Um, so we do have beginning bird watching classes that we offer twice a year. So if you're really starting to get into birds and you're really getting frustrated not knowing what all of them are, maybe come out and do beginning bird watching with us. When I got hired at Denver Audubon, they were like, go do beginning bird watching. And I was like, OK. <laughs> All right, so I went out with Hugh and Erling, I went out with Master Birders, um, and they started teaching me what are the birds we're seeing, what are we hearing, where do we look for the birds, how do they change based on what plants are in the area or what habitat you're in. Um, and so this is a great option if you want to do one of these six-week courses. Um, they start in the spring and the fall. So the, the fall one actually starts on September 27th. So it's two virtual kind of introduction classes over Zoom. And then it's four field trips with Audubon Master Birders. And they can kind of help teach you what you're seeing. Um, and then also we have our free birding field trip. So I can't say enough, if you want to learn who the birds are, you got to get out and you got to look for them. You got to go out with us in the field. So a lot of our field trips do take place in Douglas County, um, Arapahoe, Denver, and Jeffco. That tends to be where we focus our free birding field trips. Um, I do a lot of birding field trips right here along the Cherry Creek, actually. We meet at Tagawa Gardens or we meet at 17 Mile Farmhouse. Those are once a month. Um, and so I think the next one actually will be in a couple of weeks here in September, and then we'll be doing one in October and November um, with CSU Extension. So we do a partner, a partner program. And then there's a great website called eBird. So if you really start to get into this, uh, I do have an eBird account now so that when I'm out, anywhere and I see cool birds, I actually put it into the app on my phone. Um, and then all of that data goes to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And what's really amazing is that this is how we found out about this study in the first place, this 2.9 billion bird lost. They looked at historical data from all these people that had been watching birds for 50 years. And they were able to take that data and do something meaningful with it. So it's just a great way not only to watch birds for you, but to also watch birds and to share that data with scientists. 
So here's all of these things we went through. Baking windows safe, keeping cats indoors, less lawn plant natives, avoid your pesticides, drink shade-grown coffee, use less plastic, watch birds, and share what you see. Oftentimes I get the question, but where do bird feeders and bird houses fit into this mix? They didn't talk about that. And I think the reason is because certain birds will use bird houses, but not all of them. So oftentimes when I go out and I talk to schools or I go out and I talk to garden clubs or HOAs, people say, oh, I want to put up a bird house. I'm going to help birds. And I go, awesome for some birds. Most of them don't use a bird house. And if you have birds that are annoying, like a European starling that's an invasive species and is going to take over your birdhouse, then maybe a birdhouse isn't the best solution. Versus putting in, say, native plants, where a bird could nest in a shrub, or could nest in a small tree, or some other nesting opportunity. And then there's some birds, like yellow warblers, that only nest at Chatfield State Park by our nature center and will never come nest in our home landscape because we don't have enough insects to support them. We don't have the local insect load we need in our urban and suburban areas to support, to support those species. The other question might be is, okay, are you in a fight with your neighbor about their cat roaming into your property? That's a real thing. We have a lot of people, of course, who are like, I don't want my cats to be outside or I'm not a cat owner, but I have someone else that lets their cat roam and I, I've tried to have conversation with them. It has not gone well. And so if you put in a birdhouse and then you're just baiting those birds to potentially end up being... Um, eaten or attacked by, by a house cat, that might also not be a great situation to put up a birdhouse. And not all birdhouses are created equal. So if you go to certain stores, some of them are made of plastic, some of them are made of metal, you're gonna cook your baby birds. So let's not do that. You wanna make sure if you're gonna put up a birdhouse, you're using like natural wood, preferably without a lot of stains or paints. Um, really sim simple, simple is, is the best. And if you have a dead tree, that's actually the best thing to leave up. Because a lot of our birds, this is what this is designed to emulate, is a dead tree where a woodpecker has excavated a hole and a woodpecker has laid its eggs, had its babies, and then the following season, another bird species comes in to utilize that cavity. So these are just all kind of things to consider. This is an example though of a great success story around birdhouses. So the Colorado Bluebird Project is an example of a local success story around, around birdhouses. Douglas County has a very active bluebird monitoring program here in the county. Um, and it's actually the Bluebird Project is housed under Denver Audubon. That is one of the conservation projects that we run. But Douglas County has such amazing bluebird monitoring trails. Not all of those volunteers are Audubon volunteers. Just the project coordinator is our volunteer. But they've enlisted community members like you to go out out and monitor these birds because we can't be there um, on all of those trails all of the time. So this is a great example of how we've been able to boost our local bluebird populations by effectively using nesting boxes. So that's a great example of just how it can go well. And then what about bird feeders? So a couple other considerations. Do you have bears in your neighborhood? You may want to rethink artificial feeders if that's the case. Given the neighborhood, this is very different given where you live. If you live in downtown Denver, it may not be an issue. If you live in the Pinery, if you live in Castle Pines, if you live in Roxboro, bears could be a huge issue. Um, I mentioned before my background had been in exotic wildlife. One of my other fun career moves was working with polar bears. So I can attest to how intelligent and how motivated these bears are. And so part of what you are doing, if you do put out a bird feeder the wrong time of year, or you're not watching it, or you're leaving it out for long periods of time, is that you do have the possibility of training a bear to come to you or to come to your property. So other alternatives are things like putting in native plants um, that can provide those seeds, or possibly only feeding birds November to March using an artificial bird feeder. And we've just learned that most of our nesting birds are eating insects and caterpillars. And so truthfully, if you have a bird feeder out in the middle of June, you're gonna get a few birds that are gonna come to it, but a lot of birds are out foraging on insects or foraging on berries or foraging on flowers at that time. So it's really important to understand who are your, what are your wild birds eating? Um, 
And also they can create an opportunity for disease transmission if you're not good about cleaning them. So I just like to just kind of have everyone consider these different ethical ideas as you consider, do I want to use an artificial bird feeder or do I not want to use one, okay? So I just like to make sure that I mention that. And then last but not least, um, if you want to come out and hang out with us, this is our next big event. It is the 12th annual, annual Hootenanny Owl and Music Festival on Saturday, September 30th. Um, this is my daughter, Caitlin, when she was just a wee one. She's now 10 and a half. Um, but that was my first year at Audubon. So this is a great festival. It's really fun. A uh, woodsy owl comes from US Forest Service, give a hoot, don't pollute. Um, and we have a lot of other partners as well. So um, this is a great event if you're looking to get involved with us very soon, just in a couple weeks. So with that, I hope that <laughs> um, I hope that you have some great ideas after tonight and I hope that you'll be inspired to, to maybe pick one of these things. You don't have to do it all tonight. I mean, you could if you would like to, uh, you could go home. Um, but this has been a journey for me as well. You know, when I started at Audubon, I didn't think about how the coffee I drank would impact local birds. I didn't think about what type of landscaping I had at my house that was given to me my, by my development. Didn't think about it. And so this has been an opportunity and a journey for me too to just learn how are these ways and there's so many opportunities to live more bird friendly and create these bird friendly communities. But we all have to work together. And so the, the first step of that is understanding the knowledge, the knowing, just what are the options and how can we do these things? Um, and then being able to kind of come together and do that to help increase and bring back a lot of our birds in Colorado. So thank you, and I'll take questions if anyone has them at this time. We have a microphone, too, if you would like to be on microphone. We would love it if you were. Can anything be done to discourage, make, go away magpies? <laughs> it's an excellent question. Um, OK. <laughs> So this is, this is what I say when people ask me about species that they would prefer not to have. Um, if you can't beat them, join them. Um, so as somebody who, again, as a wildlife ecologist, and you know, I kind of try to really appreciate the role that every creature plays, from rattlesnakes to black widows to black-billed magpies. Um, given what you have out, so if you have bird feeders out and that's part of the attractant, then putting in some of these native plants would be a good option for you. A lot of birds like black-billed magpies, crows, ravens, those are all corvids. They are the most intelligent group of birds on the planet. So to outsmart them is actually really difficult. It can also be really fun. Um, but I'm just saying you've got to be prepared for, you know, like who, who you're up against. Um, Black-billed magpies, crows, and ravens, a lot of these larger corvids, they've actually been scientifically proven through some studies through the University of Washington that if they view you as a threat and if you do things to them that they don't like, they will come and they will let you know. They will dive bomb you. They will teach their children to recognize your face because they have facial recognition or your dog or your grandchild, whoever's, whoever is pestering them. So they're highly intelligent. So the best thing to do is to take away whatever attractants those might be. If there's bird feeders out and that's what they're coming for, then you can take the bird feeders in. And a lot of times, as we've learned tonight, a lot of the time, most of our local birds are not coming to bird feeders. But magpies, jays, they're all opportunistic feeders. Common grackles, um, European starlings. There's a lot of birds that will come to a bird feeder no matter what time of year. So you could potentially do that. Then there's also some great opportunities to, again, sort of have some psychological banter with your black-billed magpies. You can get that app on your phone and play a red tail hot call right outside of your window when you see them. And they recognize what a, what a red tail hawk might be or a great horned owl. And that can actually frighten them and make them fly off. You can also use some really fun um, stringing kind of like devices, shiny things, CDs hanging up in an area, anything that's new and novel. The issue with like owl cutouts, the little fake owls, is that they learn that they're not a real owl. So then they're not scared. So then they just walk by and strut and go, what are you gonna do about it? 
Um, so I would encourage you to go to allaboutbirds.org, actually. That's the Cornell Lab of Ornithology website, and read up on black-billed magpies, and then see if some of those techniques could potentially work for you. Hope that's helpful. Hi. How are you? Hi, good to see uh, you. So uh, many communities within Parker have, are HOAs, mm -hmm. and they have lots of rules. Yes, they do. <laughs> Too many rules. I also live in an HOA. Yeah. Yes, I get it. And so how did you deal with all your native plants and having to have that tree in your front yard? Yes. Great question. Um, so Camille and I have chatted. She and I have known each other from way back in my aquarium days, actually. Um, so yeah, I also live in an HOA. And, and what, what I was able to do, and for, I'm not going to tell you which HOA I live in, in case somebody is on the board here tonight. <laughs> Um, but I, have, I did actually approach my HOA and I tried to give them these recommended plant lists. And what was really interesting was despite the fact that I am a native plant master and I do run demonstration gardens, they, w they still were not very receptive to what I wanted to share with them. And a lot of it was just free resources, right? Just educational resources. Um, but what, what worked for me is that the fact that I actually worked within my established garden beds, that they didn't care about. I worked within the footprint of what I already had, and I just ripped out the non-native shrubs and the rose bushes and the mint that I inherited, because that was pretty much all that was in my landscape. Um, so that was, that was one way where it wasn't a big deal. Um, we can rip out turf in our backyard, no problem. <laughs> the other challenge is my own husband, um, which I can say because he's not here. Um, but no, my husband also enjoys having a little bit of grass. So, and we have small kids. You know, I have a, I have a two-year-old who loves to run through the grass. So that's also really good for them psychologically and mentally. Um, but I was required to put in a tree. So that was really interesting because I could not change their policy on that yet. So trees, amazing. Right plant, right place. If you have space for trees, go for it. Trees require a lot of water, so there's that consideration. But my particular front yard is about from here to about right here. Um, and they wanted a whole tree planted. So what I ended up doing was I ended up picking a tree that is not native to Colorado, but native to Missouri, very slow growing. So it's a near native. But knowing in 30 years, I'm still going to have to cut it down because this is going to get stressed out because of how close it's going to grow to everything. So that gives me, what, 10 years now? I can still change the HOA, maybe? Um, but yeah, so a lot of times resources are, are great to share because it's that, that at least is like, here's some lists. You can send out lists and plant recommendations very easily to all residents. Um, if you want to go so far as trying to have a presentation by someone like me to your HOA board, I've also had communities in Parker that I've done that for. And their boards are receptive. Their boards are really interested, and that's why I was allowed to come and just chat with them about what do we do for native plants, for wildlife, and why are native plants so critical and important. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Yeah. So I was wondering if you have had bears through your yard. We were doing some re-landscaping this spring and I was looking for um, bushes for the birds that had berries, but then yes. I was like, that probably wouldn't be a good idea if there's bears. Great. So a choke cherry, probably not. Okay. Choke cherry bears love, coyotes love, 70 species of bird love choke cherry, and they're also a great host plant for a lot of our butterflies and moths. So all in all, it's a wonderful plant. If you have five acres, <laughs> you can plant some choke cherry way out there. Um, but a lot of our other shrubs though, golden currant is a great option, wax currant. Um, there are on the, back of our, on the back of our native plants handout out there, there's a few uh, recommendations for native shrubs and also on our website. And CSU Extension has plant lists for a bunch of native shrub recommendations as well. But the big one I say for neighborhoods with bears is don't plant choke cherry. We have choke cherry planted at our nature center in our demonstration gardens. And I have bears wandering in and out all the time, leaving me lovely presents. 
um, right by the building. Uh, but that's also why we don't have bird feeders out. Um, so we'll put a bird feeder out for like an hour if I'm there watching it with a group of people, and then we put our bird feeders away. Um, so we do have a lot of people that ask like, oh, you don't have bird feeders out. Um, we do tend to more consistently put them out like in the winter, like in the dead of winter, we might have them out during the day. Um, but choke cherry is a huge attractant for bears. So I'm glad that you shared that because you wanna think about those types of things. If you live in the Pinery, you live in Roxboro, maybe having a bunch of choke cherry on your property wouldn't be great. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yes, yeah, and I, and I do work really closely with a lot of Colorado Parks and Wildlife District wildlife managers. Um, and so, you know, I, I oftentimes, because they're not really able to get out and do a lot of public presentations like this just because they're so busy all the time. They're law enforcement, you know, they're always roaming. They have huge districts that they cover. And so oftentimes I will just, you know, share on their behalf, their worst day of their job is when they have to come put down a bear. And so about three years ago, the district wildlife manager for Roxboro, Sedalia, we sat down and we had coffee and we just said, they said, what can we do? Because we know a lot of people put out bird feeders and we're trying to educate people on what the dangers around those are. Um, and so Kate, can you help us? And so that's why I really, I mean, I, I really am such a huge advocate for native plants um, because they're not gonna cause a lot of bears to be attracted, generally speaking. Do you want to use the microphone? I'm sorry. Yeah. In our area, we have a lot of doves. Oh, um, yes. Yes, doves, well, and squirrels. Yeah. <laughs> and, squirrels. Um, and so I have a big, huge Colorado spruce and a big, huge blue spruce in Great. my backyard. And so I have like layers of different species in there. Um, so you were talking about a whole bunch of different ones that eat bugs, but it seems like the doves hit right away, like they're waiting for it to come out in the morning. Yeah. Um, are they, they get along with the little birds, mm -hmm. but are they natural for here too, the doves? So we have two species, well, are you, do you have the, do you have the pink doves or the gray and, like, do you have like pigeons? Okay. So we have uh, rock pigeons in Colorado. We have Eurasian collar doves, which are not native. And then we have mourning doves that are native. So given which dove it is, um, rock pigeons, mourning doves, and Eurasian collar doves, they're actually the only bird species in Colorado. We have over 500 species here in the state. Those three species, 99% of their diet is seed-based. So they're going to be the ones that are like, woo, bird feeders! Let's come eat as much as we can. And they do. They eat as much as they can, and then they get really fat, and then they can't go anywhere um, because they hold a lot of it in their crop. So that is, that is totally normal. That's what we would expect from doves. But Eurasian collar doves are actually out competing. Yes, they have the, yep, they have the black necklace, or they have a black, actually, they have a black stripe back here. They're out competing our native morning doves. Um, and so, and they were introduced actually in the Florida Keys in the 70s, and they have now swept across North America. So at some point, when you have these invasive species, you know, we're not gonna get rid of all of them. So sometimes you have to kind of, you have to weigh those options, right? If you're putting up bird feeders and all you're doing is feeding the Eurasian collar doves and then they're chasing everybody else off, then maybe that's a good time to bring those seed feeders in and don't reinforce them for coming. Other questions? Grasshoppers. <laughs> is there a bird species that eats grasshoppers and what can I plant to bring that bird species into my yard? <laughs> do, you have, do you have a lot of vegetable gardens that they're attacking this year? I or just kind of everything? I have a pretty empty backyard. Okay. It's a new, it's just unestablished. I think yeah. there was some Russian sage or something like that that oh, they yes. bred oh, on. Russian but, sage, yes. Mm -hmm. but are there birds that will eat them and can I plant something different to attract those birds? Yeah, so a lot of them actually will. Um, the issue with a lot of our grasshopper species though is any, like any other insect population, this is a boom year for them. So because of all of the rain that we've had, 
naturally, which is beautiful and amazing, all of our grasses are like up to here and the grasshoppers are having a heyday. So what I can share with you is one, unfortunately, since we've lost a lot of birds in North America, that's part of those risks of those checks and balances of nature doing nature's work. And so if we're losing birds overall, we just don't have enough adult birds that would normally be eating a lot of those grasshoppers. That being said, every few years, you do get cycles of insects that they'll explode, they'll burst, and you may not have enough natural predators to help control them. But then once you hit a first frost, a lot of those insects, a lot of those grasshoppers are gonna die, but we have to wait until it gets cold. A lot of the migratory birds right now are feeding on those grasshoppers. Western kingbirds, they love them. Um, blue grosbeaks, which are um, kind of in the, they're sort of in the cardinal family, they're related to cardinals. They're huge honking beaks. They love to hunt things like that. Um, but as far as actually attracting them to your property, the grasshoppers would attract them. <laughs> if they, yeah, if they were gonna come, um, they were gonna come feed, feed on those. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, you could plant other things. So if you look at, for example, say a Western kingbird. Western kingbirds have a really amazing diverse diet. They're, a, they're one of the species actually in North America whose numbers are increasing. They're doing really well with humans and a lot of the development that's happening, but they eat every type of aerial insects that you can imagine. And then they leave Colorado around now. They're headed south already, back down to Central and South America. But if you look at their wild diet on say allaboutbirds.org, which is through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, you can start to see some of the other things they eat. They love to eat wasps. They love to eat yellow jackets. They're one of the few birds that can grab a yellow jacket and just swallow it whole, no problem. Um, they're awesome. But if you wanted to try to have like Western kingbirds in your property, sometimes it's just a matter of like, where is your house situated? If you're not next to a field, you may never get a Western kingbird. So it's difficult to know exactly like how you could attract certain species, but um, some of them also eat fruit. So something like a cedar waxwing or an American robin, they're gonna be fruit eaters in addition to being insect eaters. So if you plant fruit producing shrubs um, that are native to Colorado, then you might draw in some of those species that you wouldn't draw in using a bird feeder, if that makes sense. Yeah. I have one more question to you about pesticides. There's a sure. out there called Axiom that said that you know it's like an, a natural deterrent okay. when they spray, and okay. I'm just asking you, what do you, have you heard of okay. Axiom? So I, I, am, I can't, I've heard of them. Okay. I don't know anything about their practices. So I will say this about pesticide companies, um, and forgive me if any of you all do work for pesticide companies, but this is, this is not my area of expertise. Um, I've never used a pesticide company. So <laughs> when, I, when a sales technician comes to my front door, um, I usually go, hi, do you have a degree in entomology? And then they look at me and they go, what's entomology? What, what is that? And then I kind of go into, so like I'm on the planning committee for the Colorado Pollinators Summit and all of these plants behind you, I'm actually purposefully trying to bring in wasps and bees and spiders. I had a huge black widow on my front porch. I caught her, I put her in a glass jar, showed the whole neighborhood, and then we set her free in the field. So uh, what I will say about pesticide companies, um, my, my word of caution is that a lot of times the people who are selling the products, they're not trained in entomology. They're not even trained in insect identification. And the number of times I see on community platforms where people will say, I had a pest control company come in and tell me that this is a brown recluse, and I'll go, wow, because we really don't have brown recluse in Colorado. We have over 700 different types of species of spider in Colorado. I certainly don't know how to identify them all. And so I think a lot of times they're kind of trained to come in and sell you a product without actually really thinking about whether or not you need this product. So um, I catch spiders, I put them outside. I catch miller moths, I put them outside. The issue with pesticides is that pesticides don't stay put no matter what the pesticide is. The way that they apply it, even when they say it's eco-friendly, um, pesticides don't stay. So I'll, I'll share one little story just about hummingbirds um, because it's something that has stuck with me since I started at Denver Audubon. I did have a woman one time call because she had three hummingbirds that had just fallen dead at her home below her feeder. And 
I was like, that is bizarre. Like, I don't know what would have happened. I don't, I mean, either the nectar water was bad or something happened, right? So she starts going through this process with me and she goes, well, I was like, did anything change? Has anything happened within the last week? She said, well, I did have a company that came out and they sprayed all over like the edge of my property for insects. And she said, and I did notice that there were three moths that had climbed up into the sugar water feeder. So you think about a teeny tiny hummingbird, a drop of pesticide, no matter what it is, is either gonna potentially cause illness or potentially death. So I do just like to encourage people that if you are gonna welcome these critters in, then we, we have to think about how are we creating these spaces for them to thrive. And if we're taking other actions that are gonna counter the hard work that we're trying to do by bringing in these native plants and putting out feeders and all of these things, um, then we really wanna think about that carefully. So there's a handful of situations where pesticide may be needed, but in Colorado, I don't know if any of you have moved here from Texas or Florida, uh, um, we're pretty dry here. So it's rare that there's like an infestation of something. If you have bed bugs, absolutely have an exterminator come and help you out with that. But in most cases, a lot of the pest control companies that do just walk around trying to sell services um, are really selling things that aren't necessary. And again, I, I don't use stuff in my home um, myself. And I have a nature center where we have black widows a lot. And nobody's ever been bit. <laughs> you know, we have hundreds of school kids come every year. So I think there's a lot of, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of fear around insects and misidentification. And so when we appreciate how important those are, E.O. Wilson, who is a famous entomologist who actually passed away last year, um, one of his most famous quotes is, insects are the little things that run the world. And they really don't get the credit that they deserve. And so when we talk about birds, we also have to talk about insects because the two are married together. There yeah. That came the Miller moths? But yeah. then I found out from Tagawas that they are nighttime pollinators. Yes. So don't kill them. And I went, oh. They are. Yes. All moths, actually. Most of them are nighttime pollinators, yeah. Wow, so so many other, yes, yeah. Can you comment on uh, water for birds? Water. Like bird water. Like bird baths, like in your home landscape. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so bird baths are great. Um, uh, and sometimes in certain cases, especially in the winter, having water in your landscape for birds is more beneficial than a feeder. Um, and then also in the hot summer months as well. So if you don't wanna put out artificial bird feeders, having a bird bath or having some type of um, you know, misting system set up can be really cool. I've seen that happen, where some of the horticulturists at Denver Botanic Gardens actually hooked up like a mister to their um, to their drip irrigation so that when their drip irrigation would turn on, then they had like a little sprayer that would come out and the hummingbirds really loved that. Just like humans and any other wildlife in Colorado, water is a huge commodity for any of us. We really have to have water because we're in semi-arid climate and only 3% of our state of Colorado has water available for us. So that's through lakes, um, I'm sorry, surface water. So 3% of our surface water, uh, or 3% of our state is covered with, uh, with surface water. Um, so rivers and creeks and streams and lakes and ponds. So if you don't have water near you naturally, then putting out a bird bath is great. Just like anything else though, you wanna be cognizant of, you know, not letting stuff grow in it, um, maybe disinfecting it. If you haven't had fresh rain in a while, dumping it out. Um, so that's a great way to attract birds and help to support them. And if you have water that's moving, that's especially attractive, but of course that requires artificial setup usually. You need to have a bubbler or um, a fountain of some kind. And as long as that water is being reused, you know, that's great because um, you're not necessarily using up a lot of water. You do lose some of it to evaporation. There are some communities though, unfortunately now, that are starting to outlaw some of those as well because they don't want people using water to fill something artificial. So that's an interesting challenge on the horizon for us too, as far as recommending artificial water sources. Is that helpful? Yeah, when you said keep it clean, yeah. like how clean? Like still, there's a little green that gets in the bottom. Oh yeah, no, that's fine, don't worry about it. Yeah, no, we have, we have bird baths out at our nature center. We're not out there like bleaching them and disinfecting them every week, no. Um, because a lot of that, again, if you, especially this season, because we've had so much fresh rain water, we get a lot of new water and then it's so hot, a lot of times it evaporates and it's gone within a couple days anyway. So unless, we, we don't go out and constantly fill them just because we're not at our nature center all the time to do it. But yeah, 
other questions? We can also wrap up. Um, and then if you have other questions, I'm happy to stick around and, and take those. But thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, we have one hand. One hand. I don't, I don't need a mic. Okay, sure. <laughs> Teach your voice, yes. Sure. Um, yes. Yeah. That has been a big question um, that a lot of people have had as well. So I think it depends on your neighborhood, depends on your property. So for me, I mean, having a dead tree left in our backyard and a super uh, established, you know, neighborhood with a ton of building. I mean, my neighbor's house is going to go up because <laughs> it's literally right next to mine. It's going to go up next faster probably than that tree would. Um, but if you have big property, um, then fire mitigation is something that you would definitely have to consider. So what I would say is you have to weigh that for yourself as a home and a property owner. From a wildlife ecological perspective, I'm going to say, yeah, the way that nature has taken care of itself for centuries is by fire. And we don't go in and we don't prune all of these forests and we don't really do a lot of that work. Um, as humans until recently. For many, 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 many years, you have dead logs that fall over. It's great wildlife habitat. It's wonderful. But if you are in a place where that's going to cause a huge threat to your home, your structure, your neighborhood, then these are the things that we have to consider. So maybe taking a dead tree out is going to be important. But then there's other things you can do. You can plant native shrubs. You can look at natives that are fire resistant, of which a lot of them are. Um, what, it, what is hard, I think, sometimes is, you know, I'll hear people say, well, if there's all these tall native grasses, that can be a big fire hazard. That's true, except that what I see more of actually is invasive non-native cheatgrass that's left everywhere. And that is the most flammable. And most of our municipalities, unfortunately, really don't work to try to mitigate cheatgrass being left. Um, and so I feel like you know there's good, good times and reasons and resource allocation that should go for some of those things. But then you have to also try to go, OK, what are some other things, though, that we can do? What are other plants that I can bring in? What would be other things that would create a natural barrier for my home um, that you could put up and plant as, a, as an alternative? Yeah. It's a great question. And it's not an easy one to answer um, because human life is also so important. Um, so yeah. Yes. I, I don't need a microphone either. Okay. Uh, so there's kind of a, a two part thing. One is there is a native, I think I believe it's a native pair of bald eagles that live along the Great Big Parkway. Do you know anything about those? Or <sighs> yes. Yes. Uh, they were the hummingbird, uh, they, it seems like the hummingbird population was peaking, especially last year. They really took a big hit. Mm -hmm. And then also the barn swallows, which, which I think the, native, the town of Park Ridge has heard, uh, it seems like they're there everywhere. <laughs> so um, like a, a, is there perhaps a, a mitigation issue in the Parker area that happened to do that? Because we do know there's a ton of them. And I don't want to say we have a personal relationship, but you know, we lost a, a lot of birds in that area. Sure, that's okay. You can have a personal relationship yeah. with your birds. It's very sad. I think, no, I think that's really important. Um, so yeah, so uh, we did have avian influenza that came through last year. However, um, there was also a lot of press that was incorrect about avian influenza and what birds it was, um, it was impacting. Uh, so actually, avian influenza was sort of more of an issue for Canada geese and a lot of waterfowl. And then you also ended up having bald eagles, red-tailed hawks, other raptors that scavenge on those bodies, black-billed magpies. There you go. There's your control for black-billed <laughs> magpies. <laughs> Is uh, West Nile virus or, um, or avian flu. Um, but yeah, so a lot of those birds that are scavengers, then when they would eat those, then they would also pass away. Um, from avian influenza. But there was a lot of talk about like, oh, bring in your bird feeders. The bird feeders are passing the disease along. That's not true. Bird feeders can pass certain types of disease, but usually not avian influenza. Um, 
as far as other birds that were lost, there's all kinds of things that can happen. So this is what's really difficult when I kind of try to explain to people about bird populations and how things move and how they change. We often think in a silo of like what we see happen in our neighborhood, as opposed to thinking about like, well, what happened bigger picture, like regionally, like through the whole town of Parker. We get phone calls all the time from people. I haven't seen any hummingbirds. Where are all the hummingbirds? And I say, come to the nature center. They're all hanging out in my hummingbird garden because um, we see a ton of them. But there are localized population bursts that either flourish or they perish. Sometimes it can be because of, like you said, a heat wave. If it's a super hot day out, they can't find the food they need. Hummingbirds, 30 to 80% of their diet is insect-based. So a lot of people also misplaced, you know, wanting desire to help, but they want to put out an artificial feeder. But that's only, that's only one part of the story because a lot of what they need actually is insects to, to have protein to sustain migration. The other thing that can happen is, of course, if there was local pesticides being sprayed, maybe you have a neighbor who's putting a ton of Roundup in their landscape and they're spraying everything, uh, and a bird goes to pick off an insect that was in that garden, um, you know, uh, hummingbirds could die because they eat aphids, they eat spiders, they eat all kinds of things in our backyard landscapes. So I just always challenge people to kind of just like think big picture um, and also remember that bird populations fluctuate, insect populations fluctuate. This is how nature is, nature is not stagnant. Some years, certain groups flourish, others perish, but then there's a recovery and then it bounces back. Um, and that's part of nature's cycle. So um, yeah, so there's a lot of different explanations of what could have happened in your neighborhood specifically, um, but it's hard to know, especially if it's just a snapshot of one season, because next season it could be great. And maybe those hummingbirds literally moved four miles down the road because there was a lovely blooming event of golden current, and so they all decided to go over there and eat as opposed to being in your neighborhood. Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll wrap up. Yep, thank you. Thanks.